going on, guys? Hope you guys are doing well. Good stuff. Beautiful Friday. I'm in Charleston, South Carolina right now, hanging out down here. Got some friends in town. Uh, but I want to spend some time with you guys, too, go over some of this stuff. Um, I know we're about to get rolling. So uh, I see more and more people popping on every second. So, um, but I appreciate you guys being here, being on time. I want to make sure I get started on time. And um, I did this presentation about a week ago. It was actually a week ago this, today. And um, uh, spoke at a, an operating summit. It was all about operations, not about finding deals, not about uh, raising private money. It was all about operating multifamily and big businesses, essentially. Um, and so uh, I did this presentation, got a ton of amazing feedback on it. And I thought, you know, I should, I should share it with you guys. So I appreciate you guys registering. I appreciate you guys being here. And um, it's going to be like a full hour. And I want to make sure that I can hammer this out and run through it within the next uh, uh, hour or so. Uh, if you guys want, I'm happy to answer some questions and stuff at the end. Or if you have, you know, specific questions, just hit me up, shoot me a message on Facebook, and I'll give you guys my contact information at the end. Um, so that way you have it. All right, cool. Let's talk about building a team of A players. Um, all right, so here's the agenda. I'm going to give you a quick intro of me. Most of you guys know me. I think uh, almost all you guys do, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Uh, why build a team? Creating a foundation to build a team. Hiring the right people for that team. Uh, a compensation plan and how to afford A players. I'm going to go through my team, how I pay my team, uh, all that stuff. If you don't, if you don't have any employees, uh, I'm going to give you some insights on who I would hire first. Um, if I'm you, and then uh, how to connect. All right, so who am I? Uh, you guys, most of you guys know me, Tim Bratz. Legacy Wealth Holdings is my investment company. And I uh, bought my first property when I was 23 years old on my credit card. Um, I have experience in wholesaling. I've done the retail HGTV flips. I had a turnkey business that did 80 to 100 houses a year. I built up a big uh, residential property management company, one of the largest in Cleveland, and sold that. Um, got into vacation rentals. As soon as I got in, I got out. <laughs> I still own uh, a handful of them and they're just getting absolutely slaughtered right now. Um, I got into office. I, I like a little bit of office, certain types of office in certain locations, smaller office. I don't do big office buildings. Um, I don't know, 3% of my portfolio is office. Uh, I do some land development and uh, ground up construction on apartments. Um, I own about, I don't know, another 7, 8% of my portfolio is self storage. And we invest with amazing operators uh, through some private lending and, and investment fund that we have. Uh, but really our focus is apartments and commercial real estate. Currently on 4,180 doors. Um, and on managing those doors, I have around 225 employees. These are W-2 employees, maintenance personnel, property managers, leasing agents, and uh, more, more um, administrative type individuals on my team, 225. And we have, because we're always renovating, I, I buy a lot of value add, heavy, uh, heavy lift kind of stuff. Uh, we have around 200 contractors and laborers on site renovating our properties on a daily basis as well. Um, and I have over 300 private money lenders in all of my holdings. So we've gotten pretty good at working with people, right? We've gotten pretty good at, at figuring out who we wanna work with, who we don't wanna work with, and uh, making sure we bring in and attract the right talent into our organization. So let's talk about why build a team. First off, a lot of people look at hiring as an expense, as a cost to your business. And what I can tell you is there's two things in your business that are always an investment. One is marketing. As long as you're doing it right, I should say that, right? There's a little caveat there. As long as you're doing these two things right, uh, it'll create a return on investment. People are an asset and marketing is an asset. Meaning when you invest in marketing, you should see a return on investment. You deploy $10,000 a month in direct mail, you should see $50,000 of deal flow or $100,000 of deal flow, some sort of return on investment. Same thing with people. When you hire somebody for $50,000 a year, they should generate at least $250,000 a year in revenue for you or save you that much, right? So some, some people are revenue generating, some people are cost saving employees. They produce a return on investment. 
And this is important to understand because once you once you know how to build a team and and monetize human capital, then all of a sudden you almost get uh, uh, like anxious, right? There's like anxiety about you. Like how many people can I hire? Because for every person that you hire, you make more money, right? As long as you can manage, as long as you can train and lead these individuals the right way. Um, and it can create an incredible lifestyle for you. you know, my entire goal was to buy residual income producing assets and layer it with passive management. People think residual income and passive income are the same thing. They are not. Residual income is something you do once and you get paid on it over and over again, but it can be active still, right? Like buying a rental property is residual income, but somebody has to actively manage it. Passive income is money that hits your mailbox regardless of you doing anything, right? Uh, uh, interest returns, making a loan on a property and somebody paying you a fixed return on your investment. That's more passive, right? Uh, and it's residual, right? So it, it passive income can be residual, but it's not always, right? And, and uh, residual income can be passive, but it's not always. So how can you create a residual income producing business and layer it with passive income? One of the things that I understood early on is like I knew what my destination was, what, what, what I wanted it to be. You know, like a lot of people say, hey, I just want to make money. Well, I knew that I wanted residual income and passive income, passive management, passive ownership of it. So uh, I remember, you know, you, and I've told the story a couple of times, but a couple of years ago, my, my daughter's big, you know, she's five years old. She's big into all the Disney stories. We were watching Alice in Wonderland together. And you guys know Alice in Wonderland. She chases that rabbit down a pole and she falls into Wonderland, goes on all these crazy adventures. Um, and through that, she's walking down a path and hits a fork in the road. And it's going in two directions, and she doesn't. She just kind of stops in her in her tracks, doesn't know which way to go. And that Cheshire cat, an invisible purpley cat with a big crazy grin, pops up in a tree. And she goes, "Well, Mr. Cat, you know which which direction should I go?" And the cat says, "Well, uh, where you do where do you want to go?" And she's like, "I'm not really quite sure." He goes, "And I guess it doesn't matter which way you go, right? Because <laughs> you don't have a destination in mind. You got to know where you want to go." know what your destination is before you can create the roadmap to get there. So uh, make sure that when you're building a team, you understand, here's what I want my organizational chart to look like, here's the people I wanna have in place, and then you can go find people to fill those seats. Uh, what to expect in business. This is, I, I've been through a lot of like uh, business coaching programs, I've been through 10,000 small businesses, the Goldman Sachs program, I've been through, I've been a whole bunch of different masterminds, I've been through the Scaling Up, which is, which is Vern Harnish's program as well. And, um, and one of the things actually that I learned actually from Vern Harnish's program was there's really four stages of business. The first one is zero to a million dollars. This is kind of, and 96% of all businesses fall into zero to a million dollars. 96%. This is really, in my mind, it's a proof of concept phase. Can I actually make money doing this, right? It's a lot of solopreneurs. It's a lot of you own a job kind of a thing, like realtors and uh, uh, wholesalers who don't have a team built out and organizations, businesses, small businesses like that, okay? Once you get over a million dollars, you're like, wow, I got something here, you know? And from one to $10 million, you're like, I got something, but it's kind of a hell zone. And what I mean by that is it's, um, it's stressful because you know you can generate revenue, but you're not generating enough revenue to bring on A players. You're not generating enough revenue to bring on uh, you know, a CEO, a COO, a chief investment officer, a CMO, chief marketing officer, like all these different chief legal officer, these C-level executives that build out a C-suite and really have this business running like a real business uh, should run, you're not making enough money in one to $10 million. So it's hell zone. You gotta get out of hell zone as quickly as humanly possible. Um, from 10 to $50 million, this is where you've kind of gotten out of that hell zone, you brought some A players on, and now this is where you get a little bit more uh, peace of mind, right? So a little bit more contentness with a lot of ambition still to grow this thing bigger. That's where you want to be. That's, that's where I am right now. I haven't hit 50 million a year 
in, in revenue, um, not unless you include you know sales and, and that kind of stuff. Um, but our, our rental revenue is, I don't even know, uh, it's around $25 million or something per year. And um, uh, if we include some sales and, and stuff like that, then we would be over 50 million if we were selling some stuff, but um, we're not, we're trying not to right now, or we're selling some, something, some of my smaller properties I am. Um, but I wanna get my rental revenue up to $100 million a year residually, layered with a passive income producing business. So that's the goal for me anyways. So let's talk about creating a foundation. Just had them bring over a coffee, but it's way too hot to drink. Ah, all right, creating a foundation. One of the first things that's really important to understand when you're building your business is having core values. And core values is, um, it's not like walking into Google or walking into Zappos or walking into uh, you know, Amazon and seeing these fancy you know, uh, wall stickers on the wall talking about their core values and it's just kind of like for show. That's what I always thought it was um, before I really started building out a business. But then I realized core values are the beliefs and principles that guide an organization. It's how you make decisions and it's how your team makes decisions without you having to be there. You have to have core values in place of this is what we believe in. This is how we're going to operate. It's kind of like the 10 commandments, right? Thou shall not steal, thou shall not covet, thou shall not blah, 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 blah for your business, right? So this is how we... When we're faced with a fork in the road and we're faced with a difficult decision and we're not sure which way to go, we go back to our core values and we say, what would our core values help us do? And that's, that's not only for you know, business and marketing and those kinds of things, but it's how you manage and organize your team. I'll give you an example. Um, we have core values for my mastermind. My mastermind group's called Legacy Family. And... Um, I make sure that you know everybody who comes in, they got to have a seven-figure a year business minimum. They have to have ambitions to go bigger than that. Um, uh, they got to have a good attitude, core value. I'm going to talk about attitude in a second here. Um, but one of the other things is like you got to contribute. You got to show up. And if you don't show up, and you don't contribute to the group, then guess what? That that's, that hurts a mastermind, right? Because it's collective brain power. It's the collective power. Uh, um, um, brain power and contributions from the entire group that make a mastermind so powerful. And in, in that mastermind, I, actually, I had an event, you guys might've seen it, I was in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. We rented this massive 15,000 square foot house, slept up to 60 people and um, had this amazing time on top of this mountain and went hiking and all this stuff. And um, there was a member in my mastermind, paid, paid $30,000 to be in my mastermind, signed up and um, RSVP'd yes, I'm gonna be there. Yes, I'm going to RSVP and take one of the bedrooms, one of the private bedrooms. So we reserved that for him. And then the guy went MIA. He essentially, uh, I, I, I don't exactly know, but he didn't answer any emails. He didn't answer any um, uh, phone calls, text messages, or anything for a couple weeks leading up to it and for about two to three weeks afterward. And um, I don't know. I can only speculate. I, I heard he went partying and, and kind of... Um, just went off, off the radar for a couple of weeks. And we just can't have that, right? That, that goes against our core values in our organization. So I had to call this guy up and I gave him $30,000 back. And what's important about that lesson is if you don't stick to your core values as the leader of your organization, all of a sudden, it's gonna ruin your credibility. It's gonna ruin your influence. So other people in the group are looking at me saying, dude, this isn't how we operate. Right? Why are you letting this behavior go? And you as the leader have to go by your core values. And I had a, 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 actually a very positive conversation with the guy. I said, hey, man, here's what happened. Here's what our core values are. It just doesn't align. You know, it's not, it's not me trying to be a jerk. It's these are the core values that our organization put together with, every, with all the members and everything too. And so when you're creating your organization, I would, I would get buy-in from your team and have your team do it with you. And it allows you to make those Difficult decisions, a little less difficult. Um, here's another one. Uh, 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 talk about attitude. Uh, so you guys know Tito's Vodka, I'm sure. You guys are in real estate. I'm sure you guys know Tito's and, and liquor, right? So um, Tito's, Tito's Vodka is owned by a guy named Tito Beverage. And Tito Beverage was sitting at a Four Seasons in Hawaii with 
a buddy of mine and one of the masterminds that I'm in. And um, the guy and my buddy is like, dude, will you talk to this mastermind group and hop on a phone call with all of us? This is, I think, three, three and a half years ago. And uh, so Tigo is like, absolutely, man. So he hops on a phone call with us. I don't know, there's 10, 15 of us on the, on the call and talks to us for like two, two and a half hours about his story. And we're asking him questions. And my biggest takeaway from that story was when, when he was starting out and he had no money and he couldn't hire people and, and uh, uh, all these things, he started like, like getting a little bit of momentum, starting to build up a team. He's like, here's the only thing that, that was important was people with a good attitude. He goes, when I started hiring people, I didn't care what their skill set was. All I cared was that they had a positive attitude and he hired people with a positive attitude. And he's like, now we got 400 employees or whatever, however size there, 4,000 employees. And he goes, everybody is such a giving soul, right? They all contributing. We have these like this amazing philanthropic uh, arm of our business that we're giving back and we're, you know, the company retreats and the company um, excursions and the company events that we host. It's like amazing. Everybody's high-fiving each other all the time. They're, they're lifting each other up. Everybody has a positive attitude. And it's all because we stuck to our core values of just hiring people with a good attitude. So it's, it's uh, infectious when you have the right core values in place. Uh, let's talk about hiring the right people. So after you have your core values, then I would look at creating an organizational chart. And your organizational chart really puts the right person in the right seat. That is not mine, bud. Thank you. I'll, I'll eat all those French fries. Then. No, I won't. Thank you. Um, organizational chart puts the right person in the right seat. So really it creates uh, a vision, right? It makes you sit back and think about what do you want your organization to look like? Here's you as CEO. Here's the COO, CMO, blah, 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 blah. And you're putting the, the, the right seats in place. Then you put the roles, responsibilities in place for each one of those those um, seats, and then you can go out and find the right person to fit into that seat. I've seen amazing people come into organizations, but because they weren't in the right seat in the business, um, they were they were fa they were failing. They were having trouble. They weren't energized. They weren't driven. Uh, it was more of a draining activity because they were in the wrong seat, you know. And then I've seen I'm gonna go over like personality, behavioral assessments, and that kind of stuff in a second, but um, give them a behavioral assessment, you realize they're in the wrong seat, you need to move them over to this seat. You know, if you try to give a salesperson an administrative task, they're usually not very good at it. And then they dislike their role, they dislike their job because of that. So you got to give salespeople sales type tasks and make sure that they're in a salesy type seat. And you got to give administrative people administrative tasks. Because if you ask somebody like my wife, who's very uh, administrative and uh, uh, analytical, She's not the salesy type person. If you ask her to make sales calls, she will cry and quit, right? That's just the kind of person she is, the type of behavior. So, um, but if you put her in the right seat, she does amazing at it. Um, leadership dichotomy. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over, I'm gonna show you guys my organizational chart in a minute. A very uh, uh, boiled down version of it. Um, leadership dichotomy. Some of you guys are in, um, CG, Collective Genius, another mastermind that I'm in. And um, they had a virtual mastermind a couple of weeks ago. And they had, um, uh, what the hell is his name? I'm sorry, just blanked. But the guy who wrote uh, Extreme Ownership. Um, damn it, I can't think. Anyways, he wrote Extreme Ownership and came in, talked to us for an hour, uh, got a ton of value out of it. The number one thing that I got was this leadership dichotomy and understanding that there's two sides of running a well-oiled machine from a business standpoint. And when you're hiring people and you wanna make sure that they're the right person in the right seat, that includes the leadership team, and you wanna hire people with common values but complementary skill sets. You don't want everybody to be like you because if everybody's like you, you can only do essentially one type of task, right? You need different people in different seats to handle different responsibilities. Here's what I mean by that. If you take a look at Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, they were a, a phenomenal dichotomy of leadership. Steve Jobs was much more the visionary and much more the sales side of things and understood business elements. Steve Wozniak focused on, he understood the technical side of building a computer and making it run simply with less moving parts. 
And so they were a great dichotomy because Steve Wozniak was more in the trenches. Steve Jobs could see the whole picture, but you can't have one and not have the other and have a successful business. You need both of those. Ford and Dodge, similar dichotomy. Henry Ford understood sales and marketing. And he had some understanding of, um, of the technical side and engineering side. He was actually an engineer by trade, but he, really where he shined was his visionary concepts as a leader of his organization. And then he brought on the best engineers in the entire country, which were the Dodge brothers. And I don't know if you guys knew this, but Dodge actually owned 10% of Ford before they broke away and started Dodge. Um, and then they, they actually passed away, I think in the Spanish flu of 1918, and then Chrysler ended up buying them. Um, and that's what took Chrysler to another level. Anyways, um, Ford and Dodge, dichotomy in leadership, right? Rockefeller and Flagler, same thing. Uh, um, uh, John D. Rockefeller, the oil magnate, um, built this massive business, and he was the sales guy. He was the guy who understood um, uh, selling. He, he sold uh, Vanderbilt on giving him the lowest price point to ship oil out of, the, out of anybody in the entire country by 30%, and it allowed Rockefeller to get in at such low margins that, uh, that allowed Henry Flagler, who's the, more the technical guy in the business, um, uh, allowed him to go out and produce more oil, put things in place, uh, invest in, in uh, extracting oil and bottling oil and refining oil in a way that just gave them a leg up on the competition to the point where their company, Standard Oil, had 2%. The revenue of that business had was 2% of the gross domestic product of the country when they were around. It's insane. Uh, they said nobody will ever have that big of a business again. Uh, wild. So anyways, um, how do you figure this out if you have the right person in the right seat? I use something called DISC. Um, and I'm going to show you what that, what that looks like. So DISC is essentially four quadrants. And you can Google search DISC assessment, D-I-S-C assessment. And um, they have free tests online. I suggest you go and take a test. I suggest your spouse goes and takes a test. And I suggest everybody in your organization takes this test. Because what you will find is people are heavy in one of these four quadrants. And I'll run through them pretty quickly. D, dominance. This is very direct, very results oriented, very firm, kind of an asshole, right? Is a lot of people who fall into this category can come off as very brash and harsh in their, um, in their dealings with you. Very strong will, very forceful in opinion. Who do you guys know that falls in that court category? Maybe a Donald Trump, right? And only about 10%, maybe it's less, I think it's eight to 10% of people fall into this category, this quadrant um, in the entire population but it's 90% of CEOs fall in this quadrant. Shows you something, right? It's direct and results oriented. They don't care about your feelings. They care about getting things done. Show me results, right? Let's solve problems. That's where CEOs want to be. Influence, influence, very outgoing, enthusiastic, optimistic, fun, spirited, um, uh, just real lively, kind of the life of the party is where you fall into this category, right? Um, this is your salespeople, like a Barack Obama would fall into this, right? Uh, Well-spoken and, and likable, and you go, hey, I, I'd love to hang out with that person, right? So your sales individuals, people who are out there building rapport with your customers and your clients, they, you want them to fall into this I category, be heavier on I. Um, S, S is, uh, stands for steadiness. It's very even-tempered, very accommodating. How can I help you? very patient, very humble. I don't want people to know about me. I don't need to be the face of the organization. Um, they're, very, they're very pensive, tactful in their operations and, and how, they, how they work. Think about support when I think of S. And, and when I think about that, I think of uh, nurses. I think of teachers, people who are very support oriented. These folks would rather, uh, you know, the I's well, just want to have a good time, right? They don't care as much about results. D only cares about results. They don't care about having a good time. They don't care about helping other people. They don't care, right? If you're high, high, high D, right? S is like, all they care about is supporting others and helping others and making an impact. And um, if you give them a pat on the back and say, you did a phenomenal job. Thank you so much. You're amazing support to this organization. I couldn't have done this without you. That means more to somebody who falls in the S category than a monetary pay raise. Far more. It means far more to them than a monetary pay raise or a bonus of some sort. Let's move over to C. C is very conscientious, right? Analytical, data, reserved, precise. 
uh, they want to sit in the cubicle and just analyze numbers and look at spreadsheets, very systematic. They need all the information before they can make a decision. And then once they have all the information, they still cannot make a decision, right? <laughs> Think about engineers. Uh, that's, uh, that's very much that falls into this category. Um, now, just because you're, you're heavy in one category doesn't mean you couldn't be in a couple of categories. Think about me. Where do you guys think I would fall? I'll tell you, I'm right on the DI line. In business side of things, I'm heavier on D. In social side, in social environments, I'm much more on I side. My wife, speaking about dichotomy of relationships, is SC. She has an accounting degree and a nursing degree. So like, there you go, right? She's and, and opposites attract, right? The dichotomy in relationships, the dichotomy in, um, uh, in business. My COO, I'm high DI, he's high uh, DC. My, um, uh, my marketing assistant, much more SC um, in that regard. Uh, my ac director of acquisitions, you guys know Nick Burton, he's high I, high I with a little bit of D um, over there. So it's, it depends on who you are and wh and who, or who's in your organization of where you want them to sit and make sure that you have the right people in the right seats. Because if you take somebody who is, and, and I'll give you an example, like I'm high, high I, high D. I can do spreadsheet activities. I can do administrative tasks. I can set up utilities, right? I can, I can support and, and, and do all that kind of stuff. But it's such a draining activity for me because it's not where I'm, my genius zone, right? It's not where I'm most comfortable. So when you take somebody out of their genius zone, they can do a different activity for a little bit, but it's so draining that they need days to recover, right? Instead of letting them stay in that genius zone where they're supposed to be, that's a driver for them. They do a better job, a faster job, a more efficient job, a more effective job when they stay inside their genius zone, inside their quadrant, rather than you trying to pull them out of their quadrant. And, and what I mean by this is one plus one equals three. What Because I love raising private money and I love doing the social media stuff and I love presenting and coaching and teaching. The more I do that, the better I get at it. The better I get at it, the more results come from it. The more results from, come from it, the more I like it, right? And so the more I like it, the more I wanna do it. And the more I do it, the more, and it's a positive cycle of just continuing to do my activity. The same thing goes for people who analyze spreadsheets. Same thing goes for people who um, are in a supportive task. The more they do it, the more appreciation that they get, the more they want to do it, and the better that they become at that role. So when you keep somebody in that role, they become better. You're able to focus on the stuff that you like doing and that you're good at doing. They're able to do the exact same thing. And now you can accomplish more together because you're in the zone, right? You're focused. You're driven. You're able to just do so much more because you don't, you're not having to pull somebody out of their comfort zone and uh, try to get them to do something that they really just don't like doing and they're not good at doing. So when you're building out your team, make sure that your people are staying in the zone. Here's what my team looks like. Um, we're about halfway through. Tim Brott, CEO. So I handle marketing, branding, relationship building, raising private money to an extent. I kind of set up and have the conversations initially, and then I hand it off to Fatty Bumitri, who handles all the compliance, all the paperwork, because I'm not that guy, right? I love having a conversation high level, and when people say, hey man, I'm interested in uh, investing with you, boom, now Fatty Bumitri is gonna be the guy who gives you all the paperwork, who makes sure that you cross every T and dotted every I, that you fill it all out appropriately, check all the right boxes, you know, here's, here's the wiring instruction, that all, that's Fatty's zone. Fatty loves that side, right? Because he's much more, uh, DC than I am. I'm much more DI. So I like having this interaction with you guys, talking to people. You know, I sponsor loans as well, whatever. Um, but I, but really, this is my genius zone. This is where I'm best spent. When I go and get involved and into the weeds on operations, all I do is create chaos. My team kicks me out of the office. They're like, dude, go do what you do best, which is the marketing, branding, social media side of things. And that derives deal flow and investors and uh, students and coaching and all the other stuff that then feeds our investment business. That's the highest and best use of my time. So I should not be doing anything else. 
because if I go do that, it makes everybody else's job on my team easier. Uh, Matt Carlin, Matt Carlin's my COO. He handles all the team, all staff management, reviewing metrics, putting KPIs in place. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, all the processes, creation, execution, uh, standard operating procedures, all that stuff is all done by Matt Carlin. So as COO, that's his role. I don't try to get involved in that stuff because I cannot do it as well as Matt Carlin can. And all I would do is mess things up, right? And it'd be a draining activity for me as well. He loves it. This is like where he shines. He's built out our entire monday.com platform. It's kind of like an Asana. It's like a workflow management. And it is like, it is to me, it's nauseatingly detailed. It is so good and so amazing. And it's so simple and, and, Da, 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 like so linear um it's remarkable what he's been able to do on that front uh and he's really really good at it and that's what he loves doing and that's why he shines in it because i don't let him do anything else um or i don't want him to do anything else he doesn't want to fatty bovitri he's my chief investment officer he handles all of our in-house legal work sec compliance again making sure that the investors uh from the, on the raising money side making sure that they have all the, all the things that they need uh, quarterly updates, investor relations, um, just connecting with them, answering any sort of detail-oriented questions is Fatty's genius zone, and he loves it. Um, let's go down. Nick Burton, Director of Acquisitions. Hi, I. <clears throat> He's talking, um, but he, he can also do some stuff that's more analytical. But what, what he's done, because he's not very analytical, he's created like a calculator that is stupid simple. It's like a third grade level calculator. He plugs in a couple of numbers and it spits out the answer. And so he had to get out of his, out of his uh, uh, comfort zone a little bit. One time he put all the work together so that way he doesn't have to get out of his comfort zone again when he's analyzing deals. So we've got this super simple calculator, plugs in a couple of numbers, and even somebody who's high I and very low C can do that, um, can work in that calculator. So he handles all of our acquisitions, transaction coordination, marketing, um, really building relationships with brokers and wholesalers and real estate agents and students who are bringing us deals. Um, he's very, very good at building rapport, connecting with people, very likable guy, always laughing, joking around. Um, and, and really his, his number one metric that we, we grade him by is how many LOIs, how many letters of intent are you submitting, essentially offers on a daily basis. Uh, and then he'll, handle, he'll help with all the due diligence and stuff on the front end. Matt Suhey, Director of Property Management, or Project Management. He's the one who comes in and helps out with when things start getting into the weeds a little bit on due diligence, that's where Matt Suhey comes in. And he'll put together um, uh, you know, a scope of work for whatever the value add plan looks like. He's gonna be the one who gets bids from contractors and then oversees those contractors once they start construction after we close on the property. He's managing contractors, uh, subs, uh, suppliers, vendors, all those people you're not seeing um, that, that he would oversee. Uh, Marty Zitlow, Marty Zitlow used to be director of marketing. I actually hired a new marketing director. Her name is Kate Weatherly, and she handles everything on the education side and all marketing type stuff, uh, funnels, spin wheels, and uh, you know, content creation, all that kind of stuff. Um, she oversees all of that. Marty Zitlow's more uh, I'd almost say asset management. He used to be our dispositions guy when we were flipping houses and he still handles disposition on our uh, apartment buildings and anything that we're selling and really just makes sure that um, things are prepared to sell or to refinance. So it's kind of like asset manager. Um, so he'll come in, make sure that, you know, uh, double checking essentially as, as uh, account an accountability type person for Matt Suhey making sure everything does get 100% finished on the project management side, and then making sure it's rent ready for tenants. And then um, him and our leasing team handle up all the leasing of these units. He's handling a little bit of tenant interaction. Really, Abby Bagley handles most of that, but um, on the front end, getting tenants moved in, getting creative, getting the occupancy up so that way we can sell or we can refinance these things. Um, and then Abby Bagley is our director of property management. Really, she's in the weeds on a day-to-day -day basis of handling any sort of tenant interaction, um, overseeing the property management staff, and our uh, leasing agents, and our rent collection, and our maintenance division. She's receiving all the maintenance work orders and distributing it out to our maintenance um, folks. 
um, managing rent collections, evictions, coordinating with our attorney, um, our real estate attorney and our eviction attorney. And like, so you don't see our entire property management division uh, that, that comes to her. So really once our assets are stabilized, that's when Abby gets it. Uh, on the front end, Nick has it. Uh, during the value add phase, that's really Matt Suhey and Marty Zietlow. And then once it's stabilized, it gets handed off to Abby Baglia and she just acts as, uh, she oversees our, our in-house management in Cleveland. And then she's kind of the, uh, the liaison with the third party management for anything that's out of state. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna come back and go over compensation in a moment here um, to, that, to that sheet. So how do you compensate people? Um, really there's two major ways. One's 1099 and the other one's W2. Uh, 1099 means uh, they're not on payroll. You're paying them uh, usually for results. You cannot dictate what their hours are. You cannot dictate that they have to come into the office. You cannot, uh, you're not supposed to buy supplies, material, tools, um, anything like that for them. It's essentially somebody who's a, uh, have their own business or a solopreneur and they're coming and, and you're trading, um, an actual task for an amount of money. W-2 means they're an employee. You can dictate their hours. You can dictate when they go on vacation. You can dictate uh, when they come, when they go. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a, uh, you're paying payroll taxes. You're paying workers comp. You're paying for all these other things. And there might be benefits and uh, 401k and health benefits and uh, dental and vision and all these other things, right? If you want to build a real business, I see a lot of people do this. And I was one of these people. Like you try to, initially all I wanted was 1099. I don't want the responsibility and the liability and da 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 and all these added expenses. It, and what I was doing is I'm holding myself back from building a real business. You know, I couldn't attract quality people to my company because I was too cheap to pay a, 40, a match of 401k or too cheap to give them health insurance. Or, and, and when you realize that these things are, are an asset and what, by investing in these things for your employees, they, you, you want to attract better talent and two, they perform better and don't want to leave. You realize that like, if you want to build a real business, you need to move over to W2. You just need to hire people and pay them on a W2 schedule. Now, if they are a true 1099, like our leasing agents, they're 1099s. They go and sell houses and they come and work with us part-time basis. They hold open houses and have results and, uh, and we pay them a flat fee on the leasing side of things. And those are our real estate agents and our leasing agents, right? So they could be 1099. Our W-2 employees um, are more of our maintenance staff and um, uh, you know, all the payroll people that I just showed you right there. Our property managers that live on site or work on site on a daily basis and need to be there from you know, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Those are all W-2 employees. So if you want to build a real business, just go into W-2, get, get into uh, w2 sooner than later it just it gets a i don't know i spent so much mental energy not wanting to go to w2 that i wish i just would have done it earlier because i could have spent that energy on something better uh commission versus salary i'm a big believer in trying to compensate people for results right so i like commission better but you're not going to attract very like a lot of people who only want a commission-based income um, Salary, salary is cool, but you get some people who get complacent, right? So how do you, what I've done is I've tried to merge the two of those. Um, so one of the things that I've done is if it's commission-based and uh, what I'll do is I'll either do like a draw schedule of, you know, here's a thousand dollars a month and your commissions will draw from that. So if you make $2,000 or $4,000, you get a thousand dollars a month, 250 a week, just to help pay some of the bills. And you know, it's like a base almost. Um, but that comes off the top from your $4,000 that you made in commissions. So it's just a draw schedule. Um, the other thing that I do is I do bonuses and profit share. So uh, my, everybody that you see on that core team is a W-2 employee, and they all have some sort of profit share or equity in my business. So let me go back. Tim Bratz, owner of um, Legacy Wealth Holdings, right? Matt Carlin started out uh, on just commission. We, we co-wholesale deals together. Then I brought him in, put him on salary. Then I gave him profit share. Then I gave him, um, he actually vested into equity. So 
we've been working together for a long time uh, in different businesses for probably shoot almost 10 years. Uh, he came on, on board full time five, six years ago and yeah, about five years ago. And then um, uh, I just gave him equity in all of my deals this year. So, but he's got to vest into that. So he couldn't just leave today and be like, thanks for my equity and roll out. Um, he's got to vest into it over the next five years. So he's got to help get everything to the finish line. And, and then he's got um, uh, vested equity in all of our deals. So it creates a long-term vision, a long-term plan. I think one of the things that, I'm, that I got really good at is painting a vision for my team. All these people were with me before we were really doing big things. And, um, but I told them we would get, I'm like, dude, guys, we're going to get there. We're going to be there eventually, right? We got to pay our dues. We got to, we got to shovel shit for a couple of years here. And we're going to get into an amazing position. And here's what I'm going to do for you. Eventually you're going to profit share. You're going to have equity. And I want to, I, I want you guys to build wealth, all of us together. And it attracted a lot of A players who developed personally, developed themselves and wanted a bigger vision, uh, in order to accomplish bigger, better things. So, um, Matt Carlin, COO, is now an equity stakeholder. Fatty Bumitri, he was my um, uh, attorney for about six years until he came in-house about two years ago. And he uh, uh, he's also an equity stakeholder. Um, Matt Carlin owns 15%. Fatty Bumitri owns 15%. Nick Burton is also an equity holder. Uh, he owns, owns 5% of the, of the holdings business. And then these three are on more of a profit share. So they don't have vested equity into the company. Uh, they get paid based on profit share. So if we make, you know, oh, let's just use round numbers, a million dollars, they each have 5% profit share. So he'll make an extra $50,000 bonus. He'll make $50,000 bonus. She'll make a $50,000 bonus. Oh, and one of the things I also want to say is everybody on this page makes $48,000 a year in salary, including Tim, including me. Everybody makes $48,000 and then they get uh, profit share or equity as like kind of an incentive to bonus them. I'm a big believer in paying people enough where they're not stressed about money and not looking for a second job or thinking about stealing money or you know, putting them in that kind of position. They're not stressed. They know their basic expenses are paid, their rent or their mortgage, their car payment, and their food on the table, right? They know that's paid, but not enough where they're content. I don't want to pay them enough where they're kind of in this, hey, I'm good, let me go through the motions, right? I want to pay everybody so everybody on this page makes $48,000 a year, $4,000 a month, and then they're, based, they're paid based on equity. So if, I'm just gonna use a million dollars. We'll do multiple millions, but uh, let's say a million dollars, he owns 15%, he gets a $150,000 bonus. <clears throat> on top of his $48,000 salary. So now he's at $200,000 a year. It allowed me to attract an A player into my business. Fetty Bumitri was already making six figures before he came on board. <coughs> I convinced this guy to take a $48,000 salary, but then I gave him equity and that equity has increased his net worth by seven figures, multiple seven figures over the past 24 months. So he took a pay cut to come and work with us, but then we built up the education platform. We built up the business and now he makes multiple six figures instead of a hundred thousand dollars a year that he was making before. So now he makes multiple six figures. He take a short term pay cut for a long term gain. And because he had the vision, and he knows where we're going, I was able to attract an A player, a multiple six-figure talent into my business for $48,000 a year, $4,000 a month. And it helped me build my organization so quickly. <clears throat> so how do you afford A players? I'll give you some, some strategies. First, we wanna scale from a million to 10 million ASAP. Remember, get out of that hell zone. How do you get out of that hell zone when you can't really afford A players? You guys have heard me say this a billion times probably. I believe in a strategy that a water, a, a fraction of a watermelon is better than 100% of a grape. And what I mean by that is by building a team of A players and attracting A players into your organization, I see all these people who are like, I want a big business, but I don't want to give up any equity. Dude, you realize that Jeff Bezos only owns 11% of Amazon and he's worth $200 billion. He only owns 11%. He started the business. He gave up 89% of his company to other people to attract A players and investors into his organization. And it's allowed him to build a trillion dollar business, a 
$2 trillion business, I guess. It's increased his net worth by $200 billion because he understands that 11% of a watermelon, there's a lot more squeeze, juice in the squeeze than in 100% of a grape. So first thing I want you to do is understand that mentality. Understand that uh, uh, psychology of building a bigger business by attracting A players. So how do you do that? First thing that you can do, you can hire somebody part-time. Hire them a couple days a week or only in the mornings. Test them out. Make sure they're a good fit for the organization. Make sure they're doing their job. And um, until you, they start generating a little bit more revenue for you, then you can bring them on on a full-time basis. Not always easy to do that. Another thing you can do is you could hire fractional uh, employees. They have chief marketing officers, chief uh, finance officers, CFOs, CMOs, um, uh, chief legal officers that'll come in on a fractional basis. You pay them four to six thousand dollars a month, and they come in one day a week, one day a month, and advise. And then they're always available by phone and email. Um, and then they advise you on how to grow your business properly. And now you have this multiple six figure of your talent and you, you don't really need them, you know, full time. So you bring them in on a fractional basis and you have them advise you on a monthly to make sure that, uh, you know, you're writing the course of the ship and you make sure you're, you're on a direct path to that goal, to that destination that we talked about earlier. And then one of the things that I've done a lot is joint venturing. Um, that's how I've been able to, to, I've realized that in my business, um, and in, in developing real estate, the biggest bottleneck for me is in um, really the construction management. That is, that somebody's got to be on site every single day, kicking the tables, you know, yelling at contractors, screaming, cussing, and what the hell's going on? You know, running to Home Depot and Lowe's, uh, you know, because we're missing something. And, and it's there's a lot of time consumption that comes up, in, up with that. It comes with that. So one of the things I've realized is. If I could joint venture people who are really good at that, they can do it better than I can and like doing it, then they're gonna do it better. And all of a sudden, I'm gonna be able to focus on raising money. It's a very scalable activity. I can focus on finding deals, very scalable activity. I can focus on sponsoring loans. That's very scalable. We focus on asset management and a lot of the administrative side that my team can do remotely from anywhere in the world. And so I, I'm able to do that and I bring in joint venture partners who can help source deals and operate those deals as boots on the ground, they get into a deal that they couldn't have gotten into before, right? Because they didn't have the money or the resources or the balance sheet in order to qualify for that deal. And I'm able to get into a deal that I couldn't have gotten into before because I, there was too much of a bottleneck there. So it's a huge win for them. It's a huge win for me. And all of us build our wealth that way. I love joint ventures. I will say this. I don't like partnering across your entire business because I had a bad partnership that went south and I had to liquidate all of my properties. So instead, what I do is one, I set very clear expectations. Two, I have those very clear expectations uh, uh, outlined in the operating agreement. Each one of my properties is its own entity. So if a joint venture goes bad with one person, I sell that one property and it doesn't adversely affect my entire portfolio. Um, so I don't marry, get married uh, with anybody across my entire business. Uh, now, technically, you know, Fatty Bumitri and some of those guys on my team technically are partners, but they're minority partners in my organization. So because they're minority partners in my organization, I have 100% of the decision-making ability. Uh, but they still have the upside and they still act like an owner. You go to my Cleveland office right now, Matt Carlin's first one in, he's the last one to leave. He comes in on Saturday. He's doing whatever it takes in order to get things done. The guy's a rock star. Right, and I want to make sure he's compensated for it, and he's extremely grateful. Um, he always tells me how grateful and how how um, generous I am uh, with him. But that's because I know how valuable he is, you know. And he he understands how valuable I am. He he knows he's not going to leave and go try to do his own thing, because he, again, he understands one plus one equals three. We can accomplish more together, and he's not going to have to do any of the draining activities, in his mind, that I do. He doesn't want to jump on Facebook. He doesn't want to do coaching. He doesn't want to uh, go out and raise private money. You know, he wants to focus on operations. It's what he's really, really good at. If he does that, he knows that I take care of this stuff over here. Together, we can create a, a Ford um, Dodge relationship, right? We can create um, a Rockefeller Flagler relationship. 
We have a perfect dichotomy across our, our organization. Again, vesting into equity. Like, like uh, again, some people might pay, just pay profit share. Profit share is really, hey, you make this much money at the end of the year and you divvy it up, but nobody has equity in the business. It's a great way of getting started. I want long-term partners. Like I went to Spain for a month last year and I answered emails, I don't know, for an hour every other day, maybe. And we closed on three buildings. It was over 400 units while I was gone because my team handled all of it. And I'm pretty close to getting to a spot. Like here's the thing, I sponsored a loan, so I still have to be involved in some capacity. But I think I can actually give power of attorney to Fatty Bomitri to sign these docs for me now. And I'm not needed anymore. Right? Nick's fine in the deals. Like uh, he has power of attorney, can use my balance sheet to sponsor him, uh, sponsor the loans. Fatty Bomitri's raising private money. I've, I've developed a funnel for him where it's pretty easy for him to raise capital now. And uh, pretty soon I, I'm I'm just to this point where my organization will grow on its own even when I'm not there. So what I want is I want to attract people into my business that I give them equity and they have long-term ownership and long-term wealth building opportunity, right? It's not about me, it's about helping other people, right? Like I'm, I'm okay, I'm, a, I'm in a good shape. I don't need any more uh, uh, money or, or net worth. I'll take it, right? I like it, but now it's about if I can help enough other people get what they want, guess what? It comes back many, many times over, tenfold to me. So I'm giving them equity that they actually vest into over time. So that way they have a long-term vision and something to work towards over time. And that can be a time-driven vesting, or it could be a results-driven vesting. Hey, once we get to 5,000 units, you're going to own 10% over everything. Or once we, you know, over the next 10 years, you're going to get an extra 1% vested in and you're going to own 10% over everything over the next 10 years. Whatever that ends up being, you can do, you can be as creative as you want with it. Now, there are some tax implications. Make sure you talk to your CPA about that uh, because if you own a bunch of equity in, in buildings and you, and you just give some of your equity to one of your employees, they can have a big tax liability that comes from it. So just be careful on that. Uh, your first hire. So, my first hire was an assistant. I remember sitting in a mastermind five and a half years ago, no employees, and um, I'm doing everything, right? I'm finding deals, I'm operating these deals, I am uh, raising private money, I'm handling the project management, I'm handling contractors, I'm getting bids. Sometimes I'm actually swinging a hammer, I'm getting maintenance calls, deploying um, other subs out there, I'm handling the leasing, I'm handling rent collections, I'm handling evictions, I'm going to court, I'm filing paperwork, I'm turning on utilities, I'm doing everything. I'm banging my head against the wall and I'm like, holy cow, I, there's no way I got the bandwidth to take on any more stuff. I don't understand how people build big businesses. How the hell is this possible? How, like I see these big corporations, how, where do you get started? And I go out to this mastermind and uh, there were, I don't know, 12, 15 people in the room and I tell them my, my problem and they're like, yeah, you, you just need to hire an assistant. I was like, it, it, there, it's not that simple. <laughs> there's no way that it could be that simple. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I mean, um, you know, just hire an assistant and give them a bunch of activities that you don't want to do, you know, and uh, that, are, that are time wasters for you. I was like, well, okay, I get that. That way I can go focus on revenue generating activities. But like in 2014, I, I made $130,000, first time I ever made six figures. Um, and in 2015, this is February 2015, they're like, yeah, you got to hire an assistant. It's going to cost you whatever, 35, 40 grand a year. I was like, dude, that's a third of my income. I can't, I can't swing that. They're like, well, don't look at it like $36,000 a year. Look at it like $3,000 a month. And they said, if you could hire somebody and they could take a bunch of stuff off your plate for the next two months and you test it out and it doesn't work, can you, can you risk $6,000? I was like, yeah, yeah, I could do that. Hey, then test it out. Try it for two months. Look at it as a, a six or $9,000 investment for two to three months. Test it out. If it doesn't work, let the person go and go back to banging your head against the wall. I was like, all right, let me try it. Uh, and then they also told me that I had to pay $30,000 for the mastermind to be in that. And it was, uh, so they took about half my money going out to this two day event, right? Half my income for the, but here's what happened. Hired an assistant the next 10 months. And I joined that mastermind and the next 10 months I made $400,000. Why? Because education is an investment. There's always a return on that. People are an investment. There's always a return on that. 
and marketing. I started to understand a little bit more about marketing too. There's a return on that. Got involved in a couple of joint venture deals and was able to you know, take things to the next level. It all helped because I went out to that mastermind because I hired that first assistant. So if you don't have an assistant on your team, you don't have, or anybody on your team, hire an assistant first. And here's what I did. I time audited my calendar. And I grabbed my calendar and I went through everything and every 15 minutes for an entire week, I wrote down what I was doing. Where, where was I spending my time? And uh, I went back after that week and I looked at all the things that I did and realized how much time you waste, right? Uh, so I went through and I put either a dollar sign or a zero next to every single activity that I did every 15 minutes. And that meant it was either generate revenue or not. And then I put a smiley face or a frowny face. Keeping this simple. Do I like it or do I not like doing that? And all the smiley face things and the dollars I did. Everything else became the job description for my assistant. And I said, hey, here's, here's all the stuff that your responsibilities are. Looking to pay somebody $3,000 a month. Come on in and, and you know, essentially a couple people raised their hands. I tried to find the best one. And um, I heard that was Marty Zietlow. Marty Zietlow became my assistant. And eventually he kind of increased through the ranks to essentially being an asset manager. And uh, I'm going to go over that in a second, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. Uh, managing your team. One of the things is as soon as you hire somebody, you've got to understand how to manage them. And this is, I want you guys to take a picture of this or write this down. You cannot manage what you do not measure. You must have metrics in place because if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. If you cannot measure it, you cannot manage it. There needs to be a KPI, key performance indicator, a metric in place to manage that role. So it could be a couple things. You go look at Nick Burton. His number one KPI is not how many deals he closes because that's, that's the result of the activity. You cannot control the result. There's, I mean, you guys are in real estate. You guys know how many things can go wrong and with title issues, and financing issues, and private money issues, and uh, seller issues, and insurance issues, and all that, where it kills a deal. It's not Nick's fault. What Nick can control is the, is the activity that leads to that. So if you back it all up, I told you guys before, it's how many offers you make on a daily basis. And what you'll eventually see is that a ratio appears. And if you make 100 offers and you close one deal, then a ratio appeared. Now you can predict how, how, what, to, what you're going to accomplish next month, next year, and the next five years because you know what the ratio is. Meaning if I want to close on four deals next month, I know that we just need to make 400 offers. You need to rip out 400 offers. And whether that's all Nick or I need to hire somebody else to do that, that's what I, if that's my goal, then that is uh, the activity that is measurable because you know a certain number will get accepted, you know a certain number will get through the due diligence and fall out, you know a certain number will get through due diligence and get to the financing stage and then fall out or see it all the way through to the finish line and close on one deal per hundred. And I'm just making this up, right? I don't know. Uh, with, I mean, we, we shoot, we make probably 400 offers a month and I think we close, I'm very, I have very specific metrics though. And I think we close on one to two deals a month. But we're, again, we're very specific. We're in A and B class areas only, 100 units and bigger, um, landlord friendly states. There's a lot of stuff like that that we, uh, uh, we have a very small buy box. If I was willing to get the C class areas or um, smaller properties, we could buy a lot more apartment buildings. And by the way, if you guys are not on our VIP list, make sure you go to legacywealthholdings.com. And I think up at the top, it says like buying property or join our VIP list or something like that. Click on there and make sure you hop onto our VIP buyers list because there's a lot of stuff that we come across that are great deals that just don't fit our buy box that we then um, shoot out to our VIP buyers list. And we just kind of hand it off to you. If you close the deal, kick us a couple, you know, two points or something um, uh, on whatever the, the, the deal size is. And if you don't, you know, it's kind of a, a good faith type thing. So I don't, I don't get into like wholesale contracts and all that kind of garbage. It gets real messy with commercial real estate anyways. Um, but hey, we send you a deal and you end up buying it, uh, send us a thank you, right? Kick us a little bit of equity in there or something. We'll, we'll come up with something. So some closing thoughts. And I'm a little bit over, but I'm going to wrap up. So number one, I want you guys to remember people are an investment, right? They create a return on investment. The more you invest into building out a team, the more money you're going to make. As long as you're putting the right person in the right seat 
You're training them properly for that role. You have a metric in place, so that way you can measure their performance, right? And you're leading them and painting a vision for them on what's possible in the future. Number two, don't search for the cheapest labor. Hire the best people and structure a way to pay them more. It is gonna make your life so much better, so much easier. It's allowed me to move down to Charleston, South Carolina, and my company, my organization is growing. They're doing better without me up in Cleveland. Better, because I'm not in the mix. And I'm, I've created and put things in place to compensate them in a way that motivates them to go and accomplish some amazing things. I've given them the resources, I've given them the autonomy and the ability to make decisions where I don't have to be there. And guess what? It's hard, right? It's hard giving up control, right? But growth and control work in an inverse fashion. If you want a lot of control, you're not going to grow. If you want to grow, you got to give up control. And what you're going to find is other people can actually do it better than you sometimes if you have the right people in place. <clears throat> One of the things I've, I've kind of alluded to a few times is many people in my organization came from other positions in my organization. And when I'm hiring, I'm telling them about where I see them in the next five to 10 years. I'm already planting a seed in the interview process that, hey, I might be starting you out as a marketing assistant right now, but I see you being director of marketing. I see you being a chief marketing officer in this organization in the next five to 10 years. That's the role I'm hiring for. I hope you can fill that because that's where the opportunity is going to be. There's going to be massive opportunity for growth if you're willing to give it, put in the effort, if you're willing to uh, work as hard on yourself as you are on the job. If you're willing to go above and beyond, and show up early and stay here late and, and really commit and answer emails on the weekends and the evenings. And if you're willing to do those things, I promise you opportunities available. Big opportunity, multiple six figure opportunity with potential equity opportunity in the future. If you're willing uh, to do this. So I'm painting such a vision where they know what's possible for them from the very get-go, that they then have a long-term vision. And all the short-term hurdles and bumps in the road and roadblocks and punches in the face and brick walls that they face are not going to deter them from that long-term vision. I want them looking down the road, right? So I'm always hiring for a couple positions in advance, but I'm also always hiring for like an assistant role. Whatever the lowest level is, I want them, I want them to work through the ranks. I want them to understand what it's like to go and do the dog labor, right? And do like pull the sled. I want them to understand what it's like to be the workhorse. So that way they're going to be a better leader for my organization in the future because they've done that activity. They can't have some newbie come in and pull the wool over their eyes because they don't really know it. They know that activity, right? And so they've, they've learned through the ranks of, of how to get elevated into the business. And then they can train all those roles whenever somebody else comes in. Here's the other thing. I've talked about this a couple of times, but like hire a headhunter. I'm a terrible hirer of people. You know what I'm not gonna do? What's outside of my genius zone? What's outside of my driving zone? My driver zone is hiring people. Creating an ad, posting it on whatever, LinkedIn or uh, uh, you know, Job Advice or whatever the hell it's called. Um, uh, Indeed, any of those things. And then, and then sifting through 100 applications or 100 resumes and then calling 20 of them and then narrowing it down to the top three and then sitting with them in person and actually going through the process of hiring and, and interviewing them and showing them around. And then I'm not going to do that. It's just not, it's not going to happen. So either I'm going to put more stuff on my staff to do um, and just not ever hire that person or I'm putting more stuff on my own plate and not ever hire that person, or I'm just gonna look for the first person to raise their hand that's not as qualified, and I'm gonna hire that person, and I'm gonna deal with even more headaches and burn more calories by trying to manage somebody who wasn't qualified for the role. So you know what I found? I found that you need to find somebody who's in that zone, who's in that genius zone, and let them go out and hire somebody for you. Meaning, go hire a headhunter. Focus on what you know. Focus on what you're good at. Focus on what's important to you, which is generating revenue. 
the more revenue you generate, you can solve all these problems. So whenever you're doing anything, you're looking to build an organization or looking to grow your organization, I don't, I, I don't say, hey, how could, what do I need to do in order, like, here, what do I need to do in order to implement this idea or implement this strategy? I changed my language to who do I need to hire to implement that idea or implement that strategy? Who do I need to hire to hire that person? <laughs> because they're going to do it better than I can. I can go and focus on generating revenue and raising money and uh, social media and all those different kinds of things. I've hired a buddy of mine. If you guys, if you guys need some, I'm, this isn't like a plug for him, but um, my buddy Scott Hannis has his own HR business and he does hiring and um, all this kind of stuff. Uh, if you guys ever need somebody, just hit me up. I'll send you his contact information and um, he can help you hire people. He can help you put core values together. He can put, help you put an org chart together and uh, interview your, your current people, put KPIs in place. Like there's companies that co go out and do that. And so I'll, I'm happy to introduce you guys to my guy. I don't get paid on it or anything, um, but he's a rock star, right? I've been through a lot of these guys and, uh, and this guy's an absolute ace. He's an absolute stud. So um, I'll introduce you to him if you guys uh, need a resource there. But what I've realized is he's going to do it better than I can. So he goes out, he, he does all the interviews, and then he brings me the top three. I hop on a phone call with each one of them. I'm like, hey, I like these two. Let's meet these two in person. And then I hire one of them. And so it takes me a total of maybe three hours instead of, I don't know, call it, call it, uh, shoot, I don't even know how much time he spent. Probably a 40, maybe 60 hours of work. It narrows it down to me spending two to three hours on it to hire that person. And really, if they're not in the operations side, I don't even go to that anymore. <laughs> maybe I'll hop on a phone call, but then I'm like, hey, Matt Carlin, here's, here's the, the top three that I think, uh, or I, I like this one the best, but dude, it's up to you because they're on your team. So hire somebody else to do it. Find the who to do the what. Find the who to do the how. Um, and then social media. If you guys want to connect with me, make sure we're connected on Facebook. Make sure we're connected on Instagram. Uh, LegacyWealthHoldings.com. You can learn what, much more. A bunch of my podcasts and stuff are on there as well. Um, so check that out. And um, if you guys don't have my kids' books, you guys need my kids' books. Uh, go to Little Legacy Library. They're success personal development books for kids. Uh, modeled off of the Think and Grow Rich and How to Win Friends and Influence People and uh, Magic of Thinking Big and The Power of Positive Thinking and Richest Man in Babylon and their kids' versions. Um, I'd say four to 10 years old is like a perfect age range. But I'll tell you what, I'm getting some pretty cool messages from grownups that are reading it. And the parents are like, damn, I learned a couple of things. So uh, check those out. We're super proud of those. and just launched those a couple months ago. Um, uh, and they're really, really good. We're getting amazing reviews and stuff on them. So uh, I could say that because I didn't write them. My wife and a good friend of mine did, my two partners on that. And um, I'm really just the, the brain. It was my brainchild, right? So um, if you guys need anything, hit me up. You know where to find me. I apologize for going a little bit long, but hopefully you guys got a ton of value on this. And um, if there's anything that you need, shoot me a Facebook message or an Instagram message. Um, I answer those myself and happy to connect with any of you guys. So appreciate you guys. Have an amazing weekend. And uh, uh I actually, I'm, I'm happy to answer a couple of questions if you guys are still around. Ellis, how do you determine profit if you are in a stage where you're constantly reinvesting? Um, so it, it's 100% up to me. That's a great question. It's 100% up to me if I want to disclose or uh, make profit, share distributions or not. Um, and I, I've been in growth mode, right? So like they haven't really gotten some over the past few years. Last year, I made some bonuses or I paid out some bonuses. This year, I paid out a whole bunch throughout the year. And I just, it's up to me. Like, Two days ago, I decided to take a bunch of money that we had sitting in the account. And I was like, distribute this to everybody, just kind of keep everybody happy because they're going through some shit right now with all these refinances. Like I'm refinancing, oh man, 11 buildings right now and I'm selling, I have 10 under contract for sale. I'm talking like $75 million, port, $75 million for sale. It's all my, my smaller, lower end, or not lower end, I'd say C-class type stuff. And then um, I'm refinancing, shoot, another... I don't know, probably another hundred, almost a hundred million dollars worth of real estate. So it's um, there's a lot of stuff my team's been rocking through, and I was like, let's make sure everybody stays happy. And so I distributed some stuff, and that's 100% up to me. And so when I tell them there's profit share, it's at my discretion. Um, and that's that's how that's done. How often do you pay bonuses? Uh, monthly, quarterly? Again, at my discretion. <clears throat> Tim, when's your Legacy Wealth online event? Uh, Joe, it is October 29th and 30th. It's Commercial Empire. And then the, um, uh, if you guys have come out to Commercial Empire and you've paid for Commercial Empire before as a primary guest, 
you may come uh, to this event for free. We're not doing that anymore. It was kind of like we were doing it for a little bit, uh, but now that I, I own control the brand, we're kind of like just cleaning some stuff up. So if you've never been out, you can come out to, or I'm sorry, if you've been out before and you paid as a primary guest, you can come out to this one for free. Um, but this is gonna be like the last free time you can come. It'll be discounted in the future, um, but it's just, it, it's a little bit different. So this is great, very impressive, enjoyed it. Thanks, Matt, appreciate that, buddy. Um, okay. um, how do you measure accounting? What KPIs do you use? Um, so I have a bookkeeper, and it's more based on like a timeline of making sure that our books are up to date within a certain number of days. Uh, so essentially like by the time we end the month, we need clean books by the 7th of, uh, of the following month. So as uh, we finish up September, we need, we need to make sure that books are clean and everything's balanced by October 7th. Um, that allows us to make real time decisions on what happened um, and cash flow management, all that other stuff. Uh, will recording be sent out? Work out in the way. Um, I think you guys will get a recording tomorrow. I have access to the recording. Um, congrats, dude. Appreciate that, Obi. Great stuff. <laughs> Thanks, Roy. Uh, who's the guy that can help us hiring? His name is Scott Hannis, H-A-N-I-S. Just shoot me a message and I'll, I'll connect you with him. Or look through my friends on Facebook and he's, he's one of the guys. Um, in fact, I'll, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll tag him and you guys can uh, I'll hit him up. Uh, I think his email is scott at fortitudehrsolutions.com. Scott at fortitude, fortitude, hrsolutions.com. Pretty sure. How do you determine profit? Eh, we already talked about that one. Uh, thanks for the time. Much appreciated. Uh, do you have any other masterminds for people that does not? Yes. So this is like, this is the big thing that we're, we're launching um, and talking about at the Commercial Empire event. Um, we have something called Legacy Boardroom. It is, it is the highest value per dollar of any mastermind out there, hands down. Um, it is a daily support and a daily advisory council, advisory team to your business. Every day we hop on a live group Zoom call uh, from 12 to 1 Eastern time and we talk about how we, anything that you guys have questions about. So, hey, I made an offer and here's what the seller came back with. Nick Burton is on there two days a week, my director of acquisitions. My COO is on there one day a week. Any questions you have about operations, SOPs, KPIs, anything like that is on there. Um, and my uh, uh, chief investment officer, Fatty Bomitri, who's an attorney, is on there one day a week. I get him four times a month. Um, Nick Burton is on there eight times a month. Matt Carlin, I'm sorry. Yeah, eight times a month. Matt Collins on there four times a month. I'm on there one to two times a month, along with a special guest, an entrepreneur with a seven or eight figure business that I've invited on, who's a ninja at something that they come in and give you just kind of different angle on some stuff. But essentially, it's a it's a C level executive board for your business for a thousand dollars a month. Bring an attorney on retainer, like just Fatty's time is worth more than a thousand dollars a month. It would, it would charge you probably somewhere between fifteen to at $1,800. So it's a thousand bucks a month for an entire advisory team, a board of directors for your business that's available every single weekday, five days a week, 52 weeks a year uh, to answer any questions that you have for, it's a joke, it's a thousand dollars a month. So it helps you out with scaling up your business. I, I didn't even think to put that in here because <laughs> I didn't want this to be like a sales thing. Um, but I do want you guys to know that you guys can connect with me and ways that we can do some other stuff together. But if that's something that you guys are interested in, sign up for Commercial Empire, come out, we'll talk about it at Commercial Empire. And um, I, I, it, is, it is so friggin' valuable, the resources, the connections, the people in the room, and the content that comes from that. If you can't make 10 to 100 times the investment in that um, within 12 months, you're doing something wrong. But, I mean, by osmosis, on accident, you are going to go out and do deals and make 120 to a million dollars a year off of uh, the value in that group. So anybody can sign up for that. It's a virtual group. And then we do um, uh, an annual summit together that I think is going to take place in January, at the end of January of next year, 2021. So whatever that is, three, four months from now. 
and uh, we're all going to get together. We're going to do a big ass mastermind for a couple of days. It's going to be off the charts. So we're super excited about it. And this is just like something that's new that we're launching that is going to be um, just over the top. And it's, it's amazing. We're super, super proud of it. We put a lot of work into it. Uh, marketing KPIs, LS, uh, we, you know, we do stuff like number of posts, um, number of emails. It's, it's usually something like that. Thanks for doing this. Looking forward to reviewing. Cool. Went to high school with Kate Weatherly. She's awesome. Cool. Uh, which mastermind did you join that was 30 G's? I'm in a whole bunch of masterminds that are 30 G's. Um, I'm in five masterminds and then I run two. I run Legacy Family, which is my mastermind. Um, and then I have um, uh, uh, Legacy Boardroom, which is the, the virtual mastermind. And then I'm in five other masterminds. So uh, there's a lot of good ones out there. Um, just make sure that you have the same core values, the same you know, value proposition as the, the person who runs the group, because that's the kind of people they're gonna attract into the group. So make sure that they're a giver, you know, make sure that they're available, make sure that their team's available, make sure that the resources are available, make sure that um, they're gonna do the right thing, that they're gonna hold uh, everybody to a certain standard that's gonna be in the group, that if anybody doesn't meet that standard, they get spun out, right? They get kicked out, and, um, and that they don't, they've accomplished what you want to accomplish, right? So like I see a lot of people out there who have masterminds. They don't do, they don't do the business anymore. I'm like, dude, how much, how valuable can you be, right? Um, now if they put the right people in the group, well, that, that's beneficial too. But I just like people who coach that actually do the business. Um, change my thoughts on hiring. That's that's a plan, Mark. Appreciate that, dude. Uh, I'm returning from the Navy around 2023. We'll be looking to leverage to uh, leverage DoD Skillbridge. Cool. I'll be reaching out to you shortly to discuss potential intern options. Love that, man. Yeah, hit me up. We, we do have internships and stuff. Um, that's what I got for you guys. I got a break away at a 1230, but appreciate you guys. Have an amazing weekend. Stay safe, stay healthy, and um, hopefully I'll see you at Commercial Empire at the end of the month. Take care, guys.